Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody's still awake? We're about to go have lunch. I'm the only thing standing between you and some delicious quinoa salad or whatever you Californians eat. Uh, in New York, we would serve a steak, right? That's, that's what lunch is, steak and three martinis. Um, my name is Tyler Wood, and I'm the Global Managing Director for the CMT Association. Has anybody heard of the CMT Association? Got a few, wow, fantastic. So I'm amongst friends. Um, this, this particular presentation doesn't require any disclaimers because I'm not going to be talking about security recommendations. We're not uh, delivering a trading strategy. But hopefully what you guys get out of this is a few big picture thoughts on how you might talk to your clients about your process. How do you explain technical analysis to institutional investors, right? How many of you, just by show of hands, are running money for others? A few, a few in the back, small RIAs. A lot of you might be running your own accounts, right? But do you think about maybe tripling your capital, bringing in some investors, uh, expanding your, uh, your approach? Hopefully some of these tools will help you explain what you're doing to your clients. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what technical analysis is, and certainly what it is not, how we define it at the CMT Association, uh, a little bit about the CMT program, and then a lot more about the industry trends. All right, so we, we are a global nonprofit, we're a credentialing agency, and we work with regulators and exchanges. I spend a lot of time working with the uh, CFA community, with the academic community, so I get a lot of people telling me that uh, technical analysis, isn't that voodoo? It's like, yes, I wrote that down in my MBA program. If you hear the words technical analysis, you run the other direction, those fools will lose all your money. Uh, but in fact, there's some really simple, what John Bollinger would call first principles of the market that make this all work. So let's dive right in, if that works. All right, here's how we define technical analysis. We believe that technical analysis provides the tools to successfully navigate the gap between intrinsic value and market price across all asset classes through a disciplined, systematic approach to market behavior and the law of supply and demand. Boy, that's a lot of fancy words, huh? We love fancy words at the CMT Association. We're very long-winded. But as any good chartist will tell you, it's best explained with a graph, right? This is in all of our marketing material. We've, we've made a fancy pictorial out of something that we borrowed from Dr. Oswath de Motoran. Has anybody read anything by Oswath de Motoran? Heard that name? So this guy is an NYU Stern professor, and he lives and breathes discounted cash flows. He's the value guru. All he talks about all day long is value, value, value. So what is the value guru uh, uh, doing in our marketing material or how we think about technical analysis? Well, in some of his blog posts, he was describing this very annoying thing that happens where the price of a security either goes way above or stays way below that intrinsic value. Why does the market behave the way fundamental investors tell it to, right? And so in his blog post, he talks about the drivers of intrinsic value, right? Cash flows, the growth of the, of the company, the management team. However, market price is fueled by totally different inputs, right? Sentiment, market behavior, and then supply and demand. So let's unpack those for a little bit. Quick, uh, quick game for you. Who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2002? I'll buy your first beer tonight, happy hour. Kahneman. Kahneman, this guy right here with the awesome beard. We're gonna be beard buddies. <laughs> I owe you a beer. Uh, so the fascinating thing about Daniel Kahneman is that he's not even an economist. He's a, he's a clinical psychologist, and he and his partner, Amos Tversky, uncovered and started to describe these things called heuristics. Has anybody heard that term? Right, so we have these behaviors, just like Paul was talking about, which we can't escape. Right? They are hardwired into our cognitive neuroscience because as we evolved, right, we came from Neanderthals, and now life is a little easier, but we haven't forgotten the fact that you need to stay with the pack. If you don't, you might get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. That, that stuff is irreversible. We can't get away from it. And there are many, many, many more heuristics. We'll talk about a couple of them here in just a minute. But it's that behavioral finance uh, aspect of the market that is bringing the academic community around to understanding that technical analysis really does have something valuable to offer. And hopefully, if I tell the right funny jokes to enough professors, maybe they'll start teaching it in class. Uh, just like David Affariot this morning, you're getting the full picture where you were supposed to only get half. So 
as, as anybody who has taken a class with Ralph Acampura, you've probably seen this with an IBM chart. And what he would bring up is just the top half, and he'd say, if you're going to be a market analyst, if you're going to write research reports, or you're going to be a portfolio manager, and you're thinking about buying stock, you really ought to have a full view on what you're purchasing, right? So the first half is the company. And that's great. They have competitors in the space. They have a management team that might be very efficient or very inefficient at allocating capital throughout the firm. Maybe they pay a dividend. These are the aspects of fundamental analysis. That's understanding the company. But the stock price doesn't really care about the company. That's driven by sentiment, market, market demand. You can look at price and volume, some open interest maybe. But really, we're talking about the psychology of all market participants. So apologies that we lost the animations, but you guys can see how that's the full view of an investment manager. All right, let's switch gears, and let's take everybody back to their Econ 101 class, right? At a fixed supply, an increase in demand is going to drive the price equilibrium up the supply curve. Does everybody remember that? I know, we all had a lot of drinks in college, but it's a really simple concept that increases in demand for a static supply increases price. Well, what is the stock market, if not the greatest game of supply and demand? Let's take a look at that. Here's some order book data flow on Bank of America. Just a quick morning snapshot. Right? You see supply and demand. And what happens in the middle? We create price, the price for Bank of America stock. Right? Very, very uh, powerful market observation that technicians have known about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, this area right here, maybe it's a little difficult for some of you in the back to see, but that's $12. And right there, you see a ton of order flow, excuse me, right at $12. Can somebody tell me what's so important about $12 for Bank of America stock or, or any stock? That's right, there's nothing important about $12. It's just a big round number, right? In a sea of in infinite decimals, we human beings assign meaning to something that's simple, right? that $100 mark, there's more trading that goes on. And there's another thing that Kahneman and Tversky described in their work about the anchoring principle, right? And Paul was talking about how investors behave when they start to lose money, right? All of us, uh, if you've read their books, you, you've learned about prospect theory, it hurts so much to lose. It hurts way more to lose than it feels good to win. So for anybody who is uh, uh, getting back to break even, they're clearing out, right? And that creates uh, anchor points. Now, behavioral finance, they call this the anchoring bias. We call it supply and demand, and we call it support and resistance. Same exact concept, right? Lines of support become resistance, lines of resistance become support. Uh, thanks to the behavioral finance community, we now have some legitimacy in the halls of great academic institutions, uh, but technicians and traders have known this for hundreds of years. All right, so let's go way back. Uh, I saw all the hands go up. Everybody's a candlestick uh, chart lover. You have this guy to thank. Mona Hisahoma. So in the middle of the 18th century, this guy was trading rice in the, uh, in the rice pits of Osaka, Japan. And what a great example, right? We're talking about intrinsic value. That intrinsic value of a grain of rice should be the exact same from day to day. So why does price keep moving up and down? And what this gentleman understood was that when it was festival time and the weather was great and people were really excited, they would overtrade. They'd come into the pits and they would drive price up. And maybe there were uh, times in the year or particular weeks where people weren't doing so well. Maybe they got into a big fight with their spouse before they came into the pits. And they were despondent, and prices stayed low. Now, he understood the behavior of the traders, but he needed one more tool. So he went and developed this method of data visualization, which we all now call candlestick charts, to understand those price moves and the behavior of all the traders in the pits. So later tonight, when we're at happy hour, you guys can be thanking one of Homa. Pour one out for our Homa. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the, gr <laughs> the begrudging jo jokes. Uh, it, goes, it goes back to uh, not just individual traders and not just small size uh, firms, but this was shot uh, a few weeks ago when I was in the halls of Fidelity Investments in Boston. And they have a huge chart room, an amazing historical look. Now, we've all read books by Peter Lynch, and we know these great growth and value investors in the, in the mutual fund complex. Well, how were they making decisions? Based off of the work of teams of 20, 30 technicians who were all tracking price data. And uh, one of the speakers earlier was talking about working by hand, you know, sketching in pencil on graph paper what was going on in price. This is the original big data science, folks. 
technical analysis, that was the department that had all of the price data and gave the analysis to those PMs. So you got some point and figure charting there, uh, some long-term charts of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, and that's how they did it. Now, I get a lot of uh, pushback from the academic community, fundamental investors, big PMs that say, yeah, 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 I get it. There's some behavior in the market, and certainly on a short term, you might be able to use some technicals to capture some alpha, but I'm a long-term investor. How could this possibly work, right? These behavioral biases, they must be all arbed out by the time a big PM like me would take a position. Well, the fact is, it's all fractal, and it works on every time frame. So whether you're doing something on a two-minute chart or, or monthlies, you're looking at the same exact behaviors. So Sir John Templeton uh, uh, really did some amazing work in thinking about the bull and bear cycle and the emotions that we all go through. So in his definition, the new bull market starts at the very end of the bear, right? Where we all hate our broker, where we just got cut in half. That's the beginning of the new bull market. And it grows, right, when pe people start absolutely freaked out, it grows on some optimism, some institutional players get involved, more money comes into play and price starts to improve. Well, then it grows and, and people are even more excited that price has maybe uh, met its former, uh, former highs and continues to grow. And where does a bull market die? In total euphoria, when it can go nowhere else but up, right? You were all at the Thanksgiving table in 2017 talking to Aunt Pam about how much Bitcoin she was going to buy. Oh, yeah, 27,000? That seems like a steal. That's, it's, that's a great deal. I should buy some at 30, too, right? That's the euphoria that we talk about. And obviously, these are all very uh, glamorous uh, examples, but it works on every time frame and with lots of different uh, stocks. So I have to give some credit to our fundamental friends, because they all have also observed this irrational exuberance and these behavioral uh, traits of market participants. Has everybody read Robert Schiller's Irrational Exuberance? Great book. Highly recommend it. Uh, he also has a great brand, uh, brand marketing team, right? The Cape-Shiller Ratio. Once you put your name on a ratio, that, that pretty much makes you famous. So the cyclically adjusted PE ratio, this is a chart, our, our long-term average, wow, I'm really gonna trip over the screen. <laughs> our long-term average uh, has been around 16 for the historical. And, and you heard a lot of fundamental uh, equity analysts, sector analysts over the last eight years talking about how the US market was overpriced. It's too expensive. I can't find anything that I want to buy or recommend to get into the portfolio because it's just, it's way higher than our long-term historical average. And I don't disagree with their math, right? We are, uh, we have been overvalued in the last few years. But boy, if you weren't buying anything, what a terrible career suicide move that would be to tell your clients, yeah, we just can't buy any more Amazon because it's too expensive. And you miss that whole leg up. And the other important thing to think about here is that when we have true peaks of irrational ex exuberance, we see the Cape Schiller ratio at much higher multiples. Right? Individual securities in uh, 2000 were over 100 times earnings, and people were still buying shares. 100 times earnings. That's craziness, right? We're all a bunch of crazy people because we herd together so that we don't get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger, and that's what drives those trends. All right, so in the halls of Fidelity, I'll show you this picture too. They have observed media uh, getting it wrong over and over and over and over, picking the tops, picking the bottoms, right? So let's take a look at this example. That's Time Magazine in the spring of 2009. And the headline says, holding on for dear life. Their recommendation was, go buy some bullets and canned corn. This is the stockpocalypse, right? <laughs> Financial markets will never be back. This is, the, this is it, you know, go get in your bunker. What a tremendous buying opportunity. Man, if you could just be a contrarian to everything that Time Magazine does at the tops, you would have made a fortune, right? And, and these are glamorous examples, but you can see how the media frenzy and how sentiment is uh, spoken to us on CNBC and other media outlets that often tends to give us the wrong message about what's really going on. All right, we talked about uh, the, great, the great legends. I've also heard some people say, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm working in uh, an EM portfolio. I'm investing in the rest of the world. You know, it's, it's not the US equities market. Uh, I don't think technicals could work. Well, let's disprove that theory, right? This is uh, a great chart from our friends at Deutsche Bank, uh, before they all got fired, uh, <laughs> where, where we're looking at the Shanghai composite, right? Five years, it did nothing. Absolutely no return. And then in less than a year, it more than doubled. That's the blue line. Can you guys see that red line? 
just explodes. That is the number of new A-share brokerage accounts opening each week. More than four million Chinese people went out and opened a new brokerage account every week in the spring of 2015. That's, that's tremendous herd mentality. That's a lot of momentum. And what is it doing to price on the index? Driving it way up. What a fun time to be an investor in China, huh? So during, in that context of a big bull rally, markets doubled in less than a year, uh, you see IPOs like Beijing Baofeng Technologies come into the market. Can anybody tell me what Beijing Baofeng Technologies does? Yeah? I know Sean's got a bunch of this in his portfolio for sure. I'm, I'm guessing, based on an intrinsic value method, that they have invented time travel, right? Maybe a cold fusion? I don't know. I mean, did they invent the flux capacitor? Because there is no rational explanation for it to trade limit up every day in the month of its IPO. People could not get enough of Beijing Baofeng Technologies. It's amazing. Give me more Beijing Baofeng Technologies. Well, uh, it's actually a fellow board member of ours, James Brody, who uh, was using this example. And Beijing Baofeng Technologies was a VR company. They did some virtual reality. They did some media streaming work. So they were in the tech sector in a big bull market doing some sexy VR work. People could not get enough. Right? But there's no intrinsic value to that play. Right? You have to have some technicals in your toolkit in order to understand how to trade in this market. Well, we talked about the euphoria and the optimism at the end of a big bull rally. I happened to be in Hong Kong in July of 2015, and this was the paper that came to uh, my doorstep, the day when the only way was down. We've all heard that you know, stocks take the uh, stairs on the way up and the elevator on the way down. Chinese market took the guillotine on the way down, and they took out everybody in the way. There was no support. It was totally in free fall. Chinese government actually unplugged the exchanges and halted trading. Uh, you, you, you all probably remember that, right? Now, unplugging the exchanges probably isn't going to happen here in the US. But the CMT program and technical analysts offer tremendous risk management, right? Of course we want to take advantage of those big moves. Of course we want to be uh, trend followers when the market is moving that way. But my goodness, let's get out of the way before this happens, right? All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the CMT program. And for those of you who are thinking about taking your trading, your fund, maybe launching your own hedge fund or starting an RIA, taking in some client money, this is definitely something I'd like you to consider. And, and talk to the folks in the room who are CMT charter holders. Uh, it, it really is a program that's going to establish your prowess and the mastery of this body of knowledge. So it's a three-part exam. We offer those uh, twice a year in June and December. But why does anybody pursue a CMT? Well, it is the preeminent global designation in technical analysis. And I'm very proud of the work that the board of directors has done, not in our last 50 years, but even more specifically in our last five. Uh, has everybody heard of the CFA Institute, right? There's a global standard for fundamental analysts. And everybody with the CFA you know, brandishes that on their business card and their collar. We want that for technical analysts as well, to advance the professionalism of the discipline, and more importantly, for our members to have a differentiated value within their firms, to offer clients something that is not just a Vanguard buy and hold at $7 a trade, uh, to, to bring a structured approach to technical analysis. Right? A lot of us have learned on the job or from, uh, from various brokers and, and educational seminars. Clearly, this audience right here is very committed to their continuing education. You're here on a Saturday listening to a dope like me. Um, but, but more specifically, we want job creation, more assets under management, promotions, direct hires. And those are uh, some statistics that our marketing team turned into a really cool uh, iceberg graphic. I don't know, to me, icebergs say tremendous risk. This is, this is all about reward. Uh, but that's, that's what happens when folks get a CMT. Uh, they, they have more capital allocated to their funds. They get promoted and uh, hired away from their current firms. So we, we talked about industry trends, uh, the broker-dealer business changing dramatically right before our eyes. Uh, but for CMTs, the diversity of career paths, where you could take this in terms of strategy development, independent research, managing client money, uh, even getting into the uh, sleepy mutual fund complexes and adding some value over those long-term investment horizons. That's what CMTs do. Uh, and we certainly, uh, we certainly have seen that pool diversify quite a bit since the uh, late 60s when they were all New York sell-side research analysts doing the, doing the charting by hand. That's just a list of our top 15 employers of CMT uh, charter holders. 
And here's where the really important work happens, right? So we're a nonprofit advocacy group. We are a credentialing body, and we spend a lot of time working with the regulators. So on behalf of our members, if you are a research analyst in the, in the US and hold your CMT, you don't have to sit for FINRA's C Series 86 and 87 exam. Right? They're exempt on Series 86 and 87 because FINRA has recognized the body of knowledge is so advanced, and they actually only recognize two designations for any exemption. One is the CFA. If you are a fundamental research analyst and hold a CFA, you're exempt. And the second is if you are a technical analyst and you hold a CMT, you are exempt. But as a global organization, we're not just doing that in the US. We have projects uh, with IROC in Canada, working with the Singapore Monetary Authority, working with folks in India, the SEBI regulators. Obviously, for you guys who are part of the uh, organization, you realize that it's a huge global network. Uh, in fact, Sean's coming over to uh, Mumbai with us uh, next month uh, for the inaugural CMT India Summit. So that's a little bit about uh, what we do. Boy, that fell off the side of the chart. Uh, that's a little bit about our growth over the last several years. Uh, we really have made tremendous strides, not just here in the US, but around the world in terms of education, uh, working with the exchanges and the regulators, and working with employers to make sure that uh, they're hiring CMTs. So what have we covered today? We talked about risk management. We talked about quantitative systems development, right? So this is the modern application of technical analysis. That's what we cover in the program, things like back testing, signal testing, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, making sure that your strategy is airtight, uh, all in the context of portfolio management, because that's what it comes down to at the end of the day, is what you can deliver for your clients. And then the applied behavioral finance. Do we understand all of these uh, uh, heuristics that we ourselves are bound by and uh, our clients as well? Uh, for everybody who joins the program, there is uh, uh, some practical application of these tools. We work with Optima, but uh, hope to be working with Trade Ideas as well, just around giving people a chance to roll up their sleeves and actually use these tools. It's hard to learn technical analysis just by reading a book, so we've made it very practical and applied learning. Uh, our curriculum is published by Wiley Efficient Learning. They have a whole suite of things to help you uh, get through the program and, and make sure you're successful on the exams. Uh, you're, you're welcome to a 30% discount on whatever they are offering. Uh, just by using that code, they, they gave that to us uh, about a year ago. All right, so let's get down to brass tacks. What does it take to be successful in the CMT program? About 40 to 100 hours of study at level one about 60 to 120 hours at level two, and about 60 to 140 hours of study at level three. That gives you the, the page count on the textbooks that we have now published. And there in the third row are the average passing scores, passing rates, excuse me, for the exam over the five-year trailing average. Level three used to be our most difficult exam and had the lowest passing rate. And it has jumped to 75% in the last two years because we have candidates that are much better prepared. We have a much better course of study, much better materials to help you be successful on the exam. And frankly, I think we're just getting a much more professional group of candidates. Uh, most of the folks who are coming into the program are 15 to 20 year veterans in the market. They're working for the major firms and uh, they, they're very well equipped at passing very difficult exams. All right, so that is everything that I wanted to bring for you before uh, we head out and have a uh, vegan, gluten-free, uh, delicious lunch. Uh, but my name is Tyler Wood. I'm gonna be around all afternoon and certainly all evening. Uh, I really wanna thank David Affariot, Sean, Dan, the whole Trade Ideas team, Steve, for, uh, for inviting me out. And please, by all means, ask some questions over lunch and I look forward to meeting all of you. Thanks so much. Quick, quick, quick. Hey. Thank you. I, I just want to do a quick shout out. The, the, the CMT is a very important organization. Um, it's one of the first that took a uh, that supported trade ideas, and so I want to thank uh, you know everyone that's at the CMT. Yeah. Uh, we have on trade ideas on our team one uh, candidate, Michael, Michael Noss, who's on his way to becoming level two. We'll do December fourteenth. December fourteenth. All right. <laughs> so we've set you up here, and we want to hear about a passing grade. Uh, <laughs> Only 400 people will know whether right. it was good. So, yeah. That's right. Reach him on Twitter. Encourage him along the way. But uh, thank you again very hey, much. Thank you, David. Thanks yep. so much. Cheers.